we're very privileged to have the award-winning broadcast journalist Charlie Rose, who will moderate a conversation on security, innovation, partnership, and technology. We are so fortunate to have him with us tonight, coming straight from taping his PBS show and joining us despite what will be, I'm sure, a very early wake-up call tomorrow morning. Mr. Rose, we are very, very grateful. Thank you, uh, thank you very much. This, um, I'm honored to be here, first of all, uh, uh, because of all the things that you represent in terms of America's security, America's freedom. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, I would also be here if it wasn't a pleasure simply because Mary Boyce would have made me come. So, there. I would have also been here because Jeff Bezos and I have been friends uh, for more than 25 years, and we've had an ongoing conversation on and off television, and that's been a great honor for me. This year, 2016, marks the 55th anniversary of man's first visit to space. Alan Shepard and Yuri Gagarin spend, spending a combined total, a combined total of two hours and three minutes in the vast unknown, two hours and three minutes. But that effectively launched what we now know as the space race. Earlier this year, Scott Kelly, our own Scott Kelly, spent 4,000 times that on the International Space Station, during which time he and 12 other astronauts and cosmonauts from seven nations lived together in conducting hundreds of experiments, which we will certainly benefit from. All around them, satellites launched by 78 different countries and organizations orbited, controlling everything from intelligence gathering to GPS to missile launch detection to a serious radio. General Hyten and 38,000 men and women under his command worked 24-7 to monitor and navigate this international environment while simultaneously operating the Air Force's complex network of space resources to support and enable military operations around the world. And underlying all of this activity, an entirely new dimension has been added to the nation-based space race by Jeff Bezos and other space entrepreneurs who are working with agencies, working with agencies like NASA and Space Command, while at the same time independently pushing, independently pushing the boundaries on everything from more cost-effective launchers and payload delivery to space tourism to putting a man on Mars. General Schwartz's key themes of public-private partnership in space and America's key leadership role in technological innovations, past and present and future, provide a great jumping off point for us to have a conversation this evening. I'm thrilled to be part of it, and I'll ask them to be seated, and we'll get to it. Thank you very much. Uh, as you can, as you know, we're, we're, these men are bound by a sense of passion for outer space. So I really would like to start, um, where does this come from for each of you? Why do you find yourself at this place in which your preoccupation is the future? General? So I, uh, I was lucky enough that uh, my dad moved from uh, Southern California to Huntsville, Alabama in 1965 with the Apollo program. Yeah. And so uh, when he showed up in Huntsville, uh, we were on the way to the moon. Uh, we had a horrible disaster in January 1967. But when you think about it, from January 1967 to July of 1969, we went from a disaster to building an entire new rocket, the Saturn V, and I got to watch that rocket being built. I got to watch the F-1 engine being tested. I got to go to Cape Canaveral with my dad and watch him build the, the stand that would send us to the moon. I got to watch Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin walk on the moon in, in 1969, two days after my 10th birthday. And uh, thank goodness I was good at science and math. <laughs> <laughs> because, because I was good at science and math, I got to meet Werner Braun in August of 1969. And I developed a passion for space that was fueled by my teachers, uh, Mrs. Smith, Mrs. Bradshaw, Mrs. Spillman, Mrs. Hill, teachers that taught me what I needed to know in order to do good things in this world. And uh, thank goodness 
I joined the Air Force and I got into space and my wife kept me in the Air Force because she convinced me why would I give up something that I love to chase a dollar. Nothing personal, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> but but I, I fell in love with the Air Force and I fell in love with the military and I got to be part of something that changed the military forever because every mission that takes place in the world today is cr critically dependent on space and it's the space capabilities that that come from our United States military. Tonight, GPS, seven airmen, average age 23 years old, are sitting at Shriver Air Force Base today providing GPS for the entire world. And most of you got here tonight with GPS somehow. It's really remarkable when you think about it. It's, I'm just very lucky. Scott? Yeah, my, uh, my story is probably the complete opposite. I was a, uh, a very poor student growing up. I, was, <laughs> I, I know everyone thinks like the astronauts are the smartest guys in the, in the class and the, uh, yeah, I, I was not that. I was looking out the window uh, lo or looking at the clock trying to will it to run faster. <laughs> and, um, you know, despite my efforts, I still managed to graduate in the bottom half of my high school class. <laughs> And I actually went to a college by accident, which means I like applied to the wrong college. <laughs> and I show up at the University of Maryland in Baltimore County and I'm like, hey, when's the football game? And they're like, that's in College Park and you are at the wrong place. <laughs> and I'm, I'm being absolutely serious. I'm like the only guy that's ever gone to the wrong college. <laughs> but one day I'm walking across campus and I go into the bookstore not to buy a book because I'd probably never bought a book before <laughs> to buy like gum or potato chips or something <laughs> and I saw this book on the shelf and it had this like I felt like I was a patriotic guy and it had this red white and blue cover and this this title that showed motion in a very positive direction and I picked it up and I started looking through it and it got my attention and I purchased it and brought it back to my dorm room and lied in my un unmade dorm room bed there and read this book for over the next couple of days. And it was the story of the original fighter pilots and test pilots that became the originally Mercury, Gemini, and uh, Apollo astronauts. And it was the right stuff. And the way Tom Wolfe wrote this book, he described these guys with characteristics that I felt like I had in myself, despite the fact that I was this like 18-year-old kid that had never really done anything. And I decided right then and there, I was gonna just try my hardest to be like these guys. I didn't know how I was gonna do it, but I was just gonna like approach it step by step in very small steps that became kind of like this giant leap. So I changed schools, I changed majors, I got into the Navy, taught myself how to like pay attention and study and just worked, yeah, I just worked really, really hard. And I was really lucky, I think, along the way. And I think, you know, Preparation, timing, luck has a lot to do with things in life. But for me, it started with a book. Thank you. Awesome. Yes. Well, it's, uh, you, you know, you don't, you don't choose your uh, passions, your passions choose you. And I watched uh, Neil Armstrong step onto the moon when I was five years old, had a big impact on me. I read a lot of science fiction and uh, uh, I always wanted to be involved in space. And I think, you know, Scott, your story is very interesting because passion is a gift. And if you have a passion, then it gives you direction. And as soon as you found that, then... Much easier. You actually went to the university you intended yeah. to go to. Yep. Um, <laughs> found my way. You found your way. And so, you know, direction <laughs> is really important. But uh, the people I always worry about are the ones that don't, they haven't found, they haven't yet found what their passion is. And once you find that, once you're mission-oriented, the rest of the world starts to look simpler. It was Armstrong, though. Oh, yeah, gave five years passion. old. I remember it, you know, I was with my family and watched it on that black and white TV, and I could just tell how excited they were and picked up on that. And uh, my grandfather, uh, my, I, have a, I have an unbelievable, you win a lot of lotteries in life, and you lose a lot of lotteries in life. You get gifts. You know, I was blessed with great hair. So that's one of the, you know, it's a gift. But, um, but, but some of the things that you get in life, I think of all the things, of all the lotteries you can win, one of the ones that's the most important 
is your role models uh, early in life. And I had incredible role models, uh, many of them, but my mom is one, and she had me when I was, she was 17 years old when she had me in uh, high school in Albuquerque, New Mexico, which was not cool in Albuquerque, New Mexico to be pregnant in high school. <laughs> and uh, uh, my grandfather, who is another one of my heroes and role models, went to bat for her and, and uh, figured out how to keep her in school. The principal was trying to kick her out. He thought that being pregnant would be contagious. And, uh, and, and he, uh, anyway, my grandfather cut a deal with the principal yeah. that uh, she could stay as long as she didn't have a locker and she uh, could not have any extracurricular activities afterwards. So uh, my grandfather, being a wise man, said, done, that'll work. And uh, so my mom has been a huge part of everything. And you know, she will not recommend the high school pregnancy thing. She thinks it's a bad <laughs> idea. She'll, she'll lecture on that. But it worked out for her. And uh, my dad is a Cuban immigrant. He, he came over in Operation Pedro Pan right after Castro took over. Florida uh, Everglades refugee camp for two weeks, picked up by a Catholic mission with 15 other Cuban, Cuban boys. They sent him, not only helped him through high school, but sent him to college. He's had a great life. And I spent my uh, summers, I think because my parents were so young, um, on my grandfather's ranch with him so they could have a break. And there was a little tiny public library there um, that probably only had like, I don't know, a thousand books. But probably 300 of those thousand were science fiction books because there, some guy in town had donated his whole science fiction collection to the library. And over the course of, I don't know, half a dozen summers, I just plowed my way through all those books. And you know, the dreamers come first and then the builders come along and, and we look at those science fiction dreams and step by step, we turn them into reality. That's exactly where I want to start. What is the dream today uh, and how do you make it a reality in terms of space? Well, I think there are a lot of dreams for space. For me, the dream is I want, the, I want entrepreneurialism in space. I want there to be thousands of successful companies in space, a, a dynamic environment. And um, kind of like what you see on the internet. You know, I've watched 20 years of internet progress and you guys have to remember 20 years ago, I was driving the packages to the post office myself. This was a small company. It's grown to be a very big company. But the reason that was possible is because all the heavy lifting was already in place, all the heavy lifting infrastructure. We didn't have to build a parcel delivery system. The Postal Service existed, UPS existed. We didn't have to build a payment system. Credit card system existed. Uh, and it goes on and on. You know, the internet was built on top of the long distance phone network, so all the cables were already laid in the ground. That would have been hundreds of billions of dollars of CapEx deployment. And all of that was in place. And so we could put Amazon, we could build that on top. And in the internet, you know, two kids in a dorm room can revolutionize an entire gigantic industry. It happens. And we see, we've seen it multiple times, and there's thousands. You can't quite do that in space. And the reason is the price of admission to do interesting things in space is really high. It costs hundreds of millions of dollars to do something. And does that mean space. it has to be public-private? No, what it means to me is we haven't put, there is no, we haven't done the infrastructure. We don't have the, in, the heavy lifting infrastructure. And, and I, I know what that is. It's, 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 um, uh, it's reusable launch vehicles. If you have reusable launch vehicles, you can dramatically lower the cost of access to space. And then there will be thousands of dynamic entrepreneurial companies doing really cool things in space. I don't have to figure out what those are. If I'm 80 years old and looking back on my life and I can say, that one of the things that Blue Origin accomplished is that it made it possible for the next generation to be entrepreneurial in space because we put in place that heavy, living, heavy lifting infrastructure, the same kind of infrastructure that Amazon benefited from on the internet. If we can do that for the next generation in space, I will be a very happy 80 year old. And, and when you say it could be the next internet space, uh, once you establish the infrastructure, is it simply because it will offer unparalleled opportunity for entrepreneurism? Yeah, or is that's what I think. I think the creativity that you, in, once you're in space, there's a lot of interesting things you can do. There are very few ways to get into space. It's very difficult to get into space. <laughs> that, that, that launch uh, thing is a problem. 
<laughs> and we need, to, we need to make that easier. Once you're in space, Once you get then there. you can be creative. Yeah. But you have to, uh, and so I don't care how, if you're the smartest, most creative college student in the world and you're sitting in your dorm room, yeah. you can't build a launch vehicle. <laughs> this is not a garage activity. It's yeah. not how it works. Yeah. But do you need the government to do it, or can it well, be Well, we're already, I don't think it would ever be possible without the government. The only reason Blue Origin exists is because of all the tools and the research that the government has already done. We use all of the codes that NASA has validated, so all of our aerodynamic codes, computational fluid dynamics, everything else we do, the thermal codes we use, everything, all of that is standing on the top of the shoulders of DARPA and NASA and a bunch of other organizations that have done an incredible amount of R&D that no private company could ever afford to do. In terms of the, of the International Space Station, you were doing experiments that benefited the private sector, were you not? Absolutely, I mean, some of our, some of our science is from CASIS, which is the Center for Advancement of Science in Space. That's a, a civilian organization that's funded by NASA, but uh, you know, designed to do those type of experiments that are you know, Earth-centric, whether it's uh, you know working on rodent research that uh, you know has us, hopefully there's no rodent fans out here. They'll be fine in space. <laughs> I know there. I heard about that pizza rat in New York City. <laughs> he had a lot of fans, but when I was in space, I saw that on the internet. <laughs> but uh, we actually disassembled some mice up there for research yeah. on space. You know, medical research. Now, were you this funny before you went to space? I don't think I'm funny at all. <laughs> I mean, did it have an effect? <laughs> but yeah, so Charlie, so yeah, we, we do an incredible amount of science up there, 400 scientific experiments over the course of the, of the year I was there. And I, I need to give a shout out to one of my colleagues, Tim Coper and his wife Donna are here. And he was the guy that I turned over the yeah. command of the space station to. Yeah. Uh, so we were in space together. Now, unfortunately, he's an army guy, and I was in the Navy. But uh, go Air Force. I hope, I hope <laughs> in the next 10 years or so, Army might win the Army-Navy game. Yeah. I, would hate to, I would hate to think a whole like, generation of Army personnel <laughs> would never see them win a game. But we do a lot of science up there. Yeah. We uh, yeah. got off track. <laughs> what, what, what were you? What do you think was the most dramatic change in you, now that we can compare you with Mark? You know, there are physical changes you experience being in... in uh, it made you shorter? I, I, I actually stretched. Yeah. <laughs> um, and the media really uh, was interested in that, um, how much I... They yeah. said I grew. He's actually only this tall. I, <laughs> I grew like two feet. Actually, I stretched an inch and a half, and as soon as I saw him, he made me turn around, and we stood back to back, and I was... the we were the exact same height, so. Uh, yeah. But we lose bone mass, muscle mass. There's effects on our vision. There are other, you know, effects from the radiation. But does it change once you get back, or is it done for good? You know, you, you I think in most cases, people regain the bone, the muscle. Um, you know, it took me about six months to feel back to normal. The radiation effects are hard to quantify. You know, you may never know what, what those are, but the, uh, you know, the, the, the space environment is a harsh environment on our physiology, but we're also learning a lot on how to mitigate those effects. Right. So we, uh, you know, we have issues with our vision, but that's one of the reasons why I was there for a year and other folks are doing these experiments to figure out like what's causing uh, these problems. So when we start flying more people in space, it's not gonna be an issue. Um, so yeah, spent, a, spent an incredible <laughs> amount of time doing science and uh, we got people up there today doing, doing the same, the same thing. thing. Uh, is the technology that we will have to master and the innovation necessary uh, essential for America's competitiveness in the world? It's always been essential for America's competitiveness in the world. It'll continue to be that for as long as, as we're a nation, and I hope that's forever. And that's one of the dividends of going to space. It is one of the dividends for going to space because space is a unique environment. As both Jeff and Scott have said, it is a unique place with unique uh, physical characteristics that you really can't replicate on the Earth. You can do a lot of things on the Earth, but when you get to space, everything opens up. Um,
for the military, the biggest impediment is launch, just like it is for the commercial sector. Um, you heard the, a brief description of the space enterprise vision that we developed looking out to the future and saying what should space look like in the future. The biggest requirement in that enterprise vision is low cost access to space. Because as long as access to space is a barrier, an impediment, then all the things that we want to do, all the things that we can do, we're held back from. As soon as we cross that barrier and space becomes accessible, to large numbers of people, large numbers of access, then everything becomes different, and we have to get there. And so what else is essential to that, Jeff, in addition to reusable? Well, that's a gigantic one. So that, I think reusability is probably eight of 10 points. If you wanna lower the cost, I think with just reusability and practice, so the practice effect with humans is unbelievable. Basically, every single thing that we practice, we get better at. And they say that if you're going to have a surgery, make sure your surgeon is doing that surgery, you know, five times a day. That's ideal. If that surgeon is doing that five times a day, you're going to be very good at that surgery. So we get good at the things we practice. The most used launch vehicles in the world maybe fly 12 times a year. It's just not a lot of practice. Anything you're doing a dozen times a year, you're not, you're, it's always a little scary. It's not, you're, you're not confident about something that you do a dozen times a year. So we need practice, but that's part of a flywheel. It's part of a, a, a circle that you need to get spinning. And the key is uh, if you, you cannot reduce the cost of access to space if you throw the hardware away. This is precision hardware. It's very expensive to build. It has to be validated very, very carefully. Uh, and we need operable reusability. You know, it's not reusability if you bring it back, take the whole thing apart, inspect it. We don't fly our you know, a 747 to our vacation trip to Hawaii, and when it gets to Hawaii, they disassemble the whole thing, inspect every part, reassemble it all. That would decrease the reliability of that plane, not increase the reliability of that plane. That's where we need to get to. We're far away from that, but that's, that's Blue Origin's mission. That's what we're trying to do. That's a game changer. If we can build a, a big orbital vehicle that is reusable, real, operable reusability, that's a game changer. I, I, I wanted to say General Hyden's thing, you know, a lot of um, people, ordinary people who don't know a lot about space, have no idea how, what a linchpin access to space and space assets are to our national security. Um, it's, it, it is, it, it, however big you think it is, unless you know a lot, it's probably bigger. And right now, you know, we do have adversaries in the world, and they know, uh, you know, uh, that if they initiate a conflict with us or one of our allies, it's not going to end well for them. And that, a lot of that has to do with our advantages and technological advantages in space. That was... Who is General our biggest Heighton's, rival in this, China? General Hyten's job until Who's very biggest, recently. In terms of the competition in space, is it General China? Would, China and Russia. And are Russia, both are two... They're the two biggest competitors. Uh, I prefer to call them competitors. And oh, by the way, I don't mind competition. I, I don't think any American should mind competition. Uh, but if we're in a competition, what's the goal? To win. And if you're in the United States military, there's only one place, and that's first. How will the military uh, employment in space play itself out. I mean, is, what is it that makes space so crucial? And we understand satellites, and we understand the possibilities of vision, we understand um, that, that it gives you uh, a capacity to uh, do things that we cannot do now and see things we cannot see now. I'll, uh, I'll tell the story of Gettysburg to answer that question. It's, uh, it's interesting that you go back to Gettysburg to answer a question in the 21st century, but if you think about I love Gettysburg. I've walked that battlefield a, a dozen times. I've taken my family there. Uh, it is one of the most beautiful places in the world. Uh, but, I, but I tell you, imagine what that place looked like in July of 1863. And I, always, I was taken to the, to the heights, and General Buford is looking down Chambersburg Pipe, and here comes the Confederate Army. And uh, then I take him to the to the end of the Union flank on the second day, and Joshua Chamberlain is there, and he, he repels the, 
the Alabama Regiment coming up on the Union's left flank. And then on the third day, you go to the bottom of the hill and you walk the hill that George Pickett walked. <clears throat> and you're walking with my nephews and my kids and you're walking up that hill and they, they imagine what it was like in 1863. And then I always remember my nephew looking up at me one time when we're walking that walk and he says, Uncle John, what is it that you do in the Air Force? And I looked at him and I said, Gregory, my job is to make sure that no American soldier ever has to wonder what's on top of that hill. No American soldier has to worry about where Jeb Stewart is. No American soldier has to worry about any of that because he knows exactly where it is all the time, every minute, every day, and that's the unique advantage that space brings to the battlefield that no other nation in the world has today. Do you, do you, do you have the resources to do what you believe you have to do? So we have the resources today. The question is, will we have the resources 10 years from now and 15 years from now? Because, as Mr. Bezos said, we have adversaries that have been watching us. And if you have an advantage in the world, the advantage is not forever. And so we have adversaries that are building capabilities and weapons to deny us those capabilities in space. And that means we have to be able to defeat those capabilities and those weapons. We see them, we know what they are. They're not a mystery. We know how to defeat them. What we want to do is we want to avoid war in space. We want to avoid war altogether. What would war in space look like? War in space is an extension of war on the planet. There's no such thing as a space war, Charlie. It's just war that extends into space. But if it extends into space, it can get really ugly. Um, our adversaries have built capabilities that, that can create massive amounts of debris. Um, the last time the Chinese shot down a satellite in 2007, they increased the number of objects in space uh, 10, um, 10 percent. Uh, Scott Kelly, when he was on orbit, uh, he had to maneuver three times to avoid that Chinese debris. Uh, if we go to war in space and it goes kinetic, the environment that we all dream about, that we all look at and, and just marvel at, that we all want to go, we want to go to Mars, and if we destroy that environment, we can't get there. So we have two jobs in Air Force Space Command. We ha I had two jobs, I guess I left it yesterday. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, and the two jobs are one, to defend this nation against all enemies foreign and domestic, and we swear it just like everybody in this uniform. But the second job we have is to defend that environment as well. And we have to defend that environment because we want to be able to use that environment for our children, our grandchildren, and everybody that comes after us. But Scott, you were part of something in which there was cooperation between the Russians and the United States and others. Oh, absolutely. And, uh, you know, it's interesting how we can historically be, you know, in opposition, whether it's with the Soviet Union or at times with Russia, you know, the, the political conflict that we have, yet we have this cooperation in space. And it's, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of a tough thing, I think, for an outsider to, that, that haven't, hasn't experienced it firsthand to understand how we can, we can do this and, and do it so, uh, so successfully. And, um, you know, just being a member of a lot of space crews with a lot of, uh, of Russian cosmonauts, I think the folks in this room, and, you know, I'm a, I'm a huge patriot and I'm a big believer in, 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 in national defense and American exceptionalism, but at the same time, it's interesting the relationship we can have with these, these Russian cosmonauts that in most cases are Air Force officers. When you're put in an environment that is, um, you know, so dangerous and so risky and where you have to rely on each other literally for your lives, we just become the, the best of friends. And, and uh, you know, these guys are the, will be friends for life. And it's interesting how when conflicts occur on the ground, they really don't even affect our relationship in space because what is most important to us is taking care of one another. And that's, I think, one of the other great things about spaceflight and, and, and it being an international partnership, which, you know, hopefully one day when we do go to Mars, I, and I think it'll have to be this kind of international effort. Uh, when are we going to Mars? And how long is it going to take? <laughs> and who's going to be there? Well, um, my, my, we should go to Mars. Um, I think it would be a grand adventure. We should do it mostly because it's glorious. Um, there's, <coughs> it, it's hard this to come like up. landing a man on the moon then? 
in the foreseeable future, it probably is. Um, there, for the there, pride I don't of the like thing. The, there are many arguments that get made about Mars and, and space travel in general. Why go? What, what's the point? My own view is um, I don't like the plan B argument. So one of the common arguments for Mars mm -hmm. is we need to back up humanity on Mars in case something happens to Earth. And uh, let me tell you, we have explored this solar system. We've sent robotic probes to every planet in this solar system. This is the best planet. <laughs> <laughs> it is not even close. Now we can be sure about that. We are sure. You know, there's no planet out there it, we it, haven't it, found it, that. It, it's so good we evolved to be perfect for it. Yeah. You know, but, we're, we, we are Earthlings, and, um, <laughs> and this is a great planet, and the reason we want to go into space is not to have a backup planet. The reason we want to go into space is, in large part, to preserve and protect the Earth. Um, so space is an important part of making sure, you know, plan B is make sure plan A works, and Earth is plan A. This is, and I, I believe that over a long period of time, for a whole bunch of practical reasons, and by a long period of time, I mean hundreds of years, but for, a whole, for practical reasons, we will move all heavy industry off Earth. It'll, it, it'll be done in space where we have 24-7 access to solar power. You don't have 24-7 access to solar power on Earth. Right. The, it's nighttime half the time here. So what timeline are we talking about, Jeff, when you talk about that? Hundreds of years hundreds for this. Years. And so eventually, you know, you move all heavy industry off Earth, you send, you manufacture the things you need and send them down as, as chips, as, as little vitamins that we use on Earth. And Earth can be effectively zoned residential and light industry. And that'll be a, 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 the, an amazing way. And then we can also have a thriving civilization with a, with a trillion humans. You know, the solar system can support a lot of people. And you do, I don't, personally like the idea that, that we should have a kind of a stasis civilization. Um, I think uh, we want to continue to grow and evolve and learn and do exciting, interesting things. But this planet is finite. If we're going to do that, it means that we have to figure out how to move out into the solar system. And we know how to do it. It's just, and it needs to happen step by step. There are no shortcuts. You know, um, you can't, you know, I, the Apollo program, which was, you know, so impactful for me and for, I think, a bunch of people, um, the reason I often talk to other space lovers and like, why is there a drought? You know, if it's, there's kind of a 50-year drought. We did Apollo, and it seems like we haven't done anything that grand, that adventurous. And people thought they were going to go to Mars and do all these other things. I think we just did Apollo a little early as a civilization, as a species. It was amazing that they did it with the tools and techniques and technologies that they had. It's incredible. But today, we finally have the tools, techniques, and technologies. We need to do it in a more sustainable and way. And do we have the will? And is there a, a man on the moon? It's a lot less expensive. We don't have the will to do Mars in the foreseeable future. That's still a very oh. expensive thing. But, but to continue. Do we have the will to take the next step and the next step I and think the so. next step? I do. But I, yeah. yeah. And, and what are the impediments? Is it well, just the will? No. It's, or is it technological? It's techno it, uh, you know. I really believe that eight of the 10 points are, you have to focus on reusability. Then you can reduce costs. Look, if you um, look at the cost of propellants on a launch vehicle, they're very, very inexpensive. A launch vehicle that with a million pounds of propellants on board, uh, you know, uh, two thirds of that might be liquid oxygen. Do you know how much liquid oxygen costs per pound? 10 cents a pound. So, you know, you've got, Let's say you've got 600,000 pounds of liquid oxygen on board a launcher. It costs $60,000 for the liquid oxygen. And the kerosene or the whatever fuel you're using, in our case, we're using liquefied natural gas, which is incredibly inexpensive. You're talking about literally a few hundred thousand dollars worth of propellants on something that costs, a, a launch costs $100 million. So how do you get from a few hundred thousand dollars of fuel and oxidizer to $100 million? It has nothing to do with the recurring operating costs of the vehicle, really. It has to do with the fact that you build that expensive hardware, which has to be validated unbelievably carefully, and then you use it one time and throw it away. When will you get a return on your investment? Oh, God, Charlie, that's a rude question. <laughs> um, uh, I <laughs> That, uh, 
you know, I get asked that question from time to time, and it's a... It's, it's more about the Amazon history than it is it, about... It's a, you have to be, to, to, to do a for-profit space company, you have to be very long-term oriented, <laughs> um, which I am. But this is a, you have to remember that, you know, nobody would go into the space business by, you know, in the kind of force ranking all of their highest return on invested capital opportunities. I always tell my friends, look, if I were just going for the best returns, I'd start a new salty snack food business. You know, like, <laughs> how can you go wrong with that? You know, that's or, or buy for, a newspaper. That's going to work for you. No, that's, that's also not a good choice. Um. <laughs> Before I leave, I got to, just a couple of things. Where, um, would you like to go back to space? Yes. Absolutely. Uh, I wish I could go for a little visit. Yeah. I would not. Not, uh, not to stay for a long trip. <laughs> you know, had, not, had I not flown for a year, I would absolutely do it again. Yeah. But I probably wouldn't do it a second time. Okay. Here's a long time. What do you worry about the most? Uh, what do I worry? The, actually, what I worry about the most is, uh, since we're talking to industry, uh, I actually worry a little about you. Uh, because we have adversaries that are going very fast. And our nation has to go really fast. And our processes, our industrial acquisition processes today are bureaucratic and slow. Uh, the United States of America has no trouble moving fast if we can get the bureaucracy out of the way. So my biggest concern is can we get out of our own way and just go do it? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Oh. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. Thank very nice to meet you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Ladies and gentlemen. Nobody better than Charlie Rose. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. And, and let me just conclude by saying that here we've had the son of a rocket scientist, the son of a Cuban immigrant, and an American astronaut, only in America. Thank you very much.